Ian, I love talking about theories of consciousness and how it works and your theory, and, which is fascinating. Um, I, I want to try to take a step back uh, for all of us, with all the, our different theories, and ask, wh what is the kind of information in the world, the data points that, that we know, consciously or unconsciously, that we apprehend in order to make theories? And, and, and this would apply to people who have theories. They can be physical, as they can believe in God, or it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. What are the things we all need to look at? Well, fortunately, we have a, a range of, of information about how the brain and the mind work, which come from partly experiments that can be set up by scientists, partly by observation of experiments of nature. In other words, when somebody has a, a, a stroke or a mm. tumor or, or, or an injury to their brain, um, there are ways in which we can examine each hemisphere of the brain separately. Um, in patients particularly who've had the two halves of the brain separated by a procedure called callosotomy, which was pioneered in Caltech in the 1960s, and in the wake of which scientists were the first time able to ask one half of the brain questions and the other half the same questions and see how their answers differed. Now that is one way in which we get an insight into what is going yeah. on in the generation of the mind from the brain. And of course, when I say generation, I don't mean that the, the brain originates it, but that the brain is shaping the kind of consciousness that person is able to have, mm -hmm. channeling mm -hmm. it, molding it, sculpting it. Mm -hmm. And um, this happens also with mental illnesses. So we see that people begin to believe things that are, as far as the rest of us are concerned, completely impossible. That there are Martians living in the garden shed, um, that the neighbors are talking to them through a plug socket in the wall. And what's interesting about these um, conclusions that people come to is that they are not unreasonable. Well, they're unreasonable, but they're not irrational. Mm. So, as uh, G.K. Chesterton said, a madman is not somebody who's lost his reason. He's lost everything but his reason. <laughs> so, he hears a voice, he looks around the room, he sees there is nobody there. So, he deduces, there is somebody who's speaking to me, but they're not in this room. How is their voice getting into this room? The only ingress into this room I can see is that socket in the wall. It must be coming through there. It's entirely logical. It's completely wrong. So we see that there are certain processes that normally go on in the mind and the brain that are absent when somebody has um, a malfunctioning brain. And that helps again to build up a picture of what different parts of the brain are able to give to us. Mm -hmm. Another interesting thing is patients who have damage to the right hemisphere, for example, will, in not rare cases, but in common cases, deny that there is any problem with a completely disabled half of their body. They have a right hemisphere stroke. As a result, the left half of their body may be paralyzed, but they will flatly deny there is anything wrong with it. And they will say, well, um, the doctor says, is everything all right with you today? And they say, yes, absolutely. It's, how's your left arm? Is it, is it working? Yes, of course. Can you show us? And they go there and nothing moves. And if you then say to them, you pull the arm around and say, can you move that? They say, oh, that's not my arm, doctor. That's your arm. Mm -hmm. Or it belongs to that patient over mm -hmm. there. So they are completely, they're not as it were, uh, lying, their world has changed in some way, which means they're incapable of discerning that this part of their body belongs to them. Now, through thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of experiments of this kind by nature, and observation, in other words, of patients with both brain and mental illnesses, which are not a... a it's not a complete dichotomy, obviously. We understand that most mental illnesses are... All mental illnesses are, in fact, due to things going on in the brain as well. So through these sort of observations, through setting up laboratory experiments, through asking people to answer questions in manipulated circumstances, we learn about how we understand reality, how it changes when certain parameters are altered. And these things can be methodologically reproducible and therefore give us fairly solid information about the way in which the brain sculpts the consciousness that we have. Yet those kinds of examples are used by physicalists to show that consciousness is only 
what the brain produces because all the anomalies that occur are, are part of that person's consciousness, but we know it's because of a, of a brain uh, uh, in, in insult or trauma or, or disease. They do say that, of course, they would, wouldn't they? Because they believe that uh, only things that can be measured in the brain are real. But they'd have difficulty, for example, dealing with patients with a condition called hydranencephaly. Uh, hydrocephalus is a fairly familiar yeah. uh, phenomenon in which a large part of the skull may be filled with fluid at the expense of brain tissue. And even that is um, remarkable in that uh, uh, famously, uh, I know of a certain famous case of a man who had a first class degree in mathematics from Leeds University and an IQ of 126, was also socially normal and he had only a thin rim of cortex in the brain, almost the rest of it was not there. Um, but uh, even more dramatically, there are people with so-called hydranencephalus. They're relatively rare, and from birth, they have effectively no brain. So there is something called the brain stem, which is a sort of extension of the spinal cord that goes up to the base of the brain. And that is all they're functioning with. They have no visual cortex, auditory cortex or so on, but they can enjoy music. They can, um, they can understand uh, faces. They, can, um, they have friends they have favorite toys uh, and so on. They don't function, of course, as normal adults. So how could they? Mm -hmm. But the remarkable fact is that they have conscious experience and it's not dependent on there being the brain there to do it. There's another phenomenon that uh, you, you undoubtedly will have heard of called terminal lucidity, yes. in which patients who maybe for years have been moribund and more or less incapable of speech or, or, or any evidence of thinking will suddenly uh, come to life, as it were, and start talking and thinking and expressing themselves. And almost invariably, within about 24 hours, they've died. Now, quite what is happening there, I don't know. But what is uh, suggested is that the brain that has been the, the, the kind of um, uh, straight jacket on, on mm. their thinking loses its power to be so anymore and something more comes to life which mm. is not just brain dependent. Yes. Now, I, I, I don't know how to understand these things. I think it's rash to rush to conclusions. On the other hand, I think what we can say is that the physicalist who says that everything is simply dependent on the functioning of the brain in the way that we understand it normally can't be right. Also, I'd really simply ask such a person to reflect on what the things are that really make their life worth living, unless their ego has become so large that it's only winning the next scientific prize. But if they still have a life and they still love people and nature and the arts and uh, all the things that we value, where are these things in the brain? Are they limited in the brain? What is going on here? It's something that is, in my view, uh, leads us to suggest, unless we're very gullible, that there's more going on here than just the brain. So I think these so-called physicalist skeptics are some of the most gullible people alive.